Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today I'm gonna to be going over the Macroeconomics FRQ. This is set one from the 2024 exam. I just got these questions a few hours ago. I've gone through and done my best to answer them based on what I think the answers are likely to be. I uh, just wanna let you know I, I don't work for the college board so I don't really know for sure what the rubrics are going to say and you never really know where they're going to put the bar for some of these points, but these are my best guesses of what I think they're going to be looking for in uh, this year's uh, scoring for these. All right, let's go ahead and jump into question number one. Uh, the, alpha, the economy of alpha is in short run equilibrium with a cyclical unemployment rate of 3%. That means they have some a uh, recessionary gap, by the way. Uh, a frictional unemployment rate of 4% and an actual unemployment rate of 8%. Uh, calculate uh, the first part. We're going to calculate to alpha's natural rate of unemployment, and we're going to show our work. Remember, uh, the difference between the actual unemployment rate and the natural rate is the cyclical unemployment rate, because when they're at the natural rate of unemployment, cyclical is zero. So we're just going to take the actual uh, unemployment rate and subtract the cyclical rate, and that gives us the natural rate of 5%. On to part B. Here we go. We're going to uh, go ahead and gra graph a aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, and we're going to have all of that stuff on it. Uh, and it's going to be based on the current uh, equilibrium for alpha. All right, so there it is for us. We've got a recessionary gap, so you should have your ASAD model with uh, Y1 intersecting at or coming from the intersection between aggregate demand and, ag and short run aggregate supply, and it will be a lower output than the full employment level of output that you should be labeling YF, and we have our current equilibrium price level marked as well. On to part C. Uh, we're going to assume that policymakers take no action, so they do nothing to close the gap. Explain how Alpha's economy will adjust to full employment in the long run. This is just our long run adjustment to full employment with no government intervention. Of course, here's how that happens. I hope you got this one right. Wages and potentially other resource prices, but wages should be enough, will decrease. Those lower input costs will shift the short run aggregate supply curve to the right until output, real output, equals YF, or the full employment level of output. All right, on to the next part. We're going to, on our graph that we drew in part A, show that long run change. All right, so I just said that the short run aggregate supply curve is going to shift to the right until the current level of output equals YF. So there we go, shift that short run aggregate supply curve, and we have to mark the new price level, which is a lower price level, at PL2, which is the new intersection between the SRAS and the AD curve. All right, on to the next part. For part D, we're going to assume that instead, the Alpha's uh, central bank is considering using monetary policy to close the recessionary output gap and the banking system in Alpha has ample reserves. We're going to identify a specific monetary policy action the Central Bank of Alpha could take to close the output gap. And here, since they have ample reserves, there's only two possibilities you could answer. Decrease administered rates or interest on reserves. All right, there we go. Now, after that, we're going to, and by the way, administered rates includes uh, um, interest on reserves as well as the discount rate. So we're going to now draw the reserves market graph. First time they've made us draw the reserves market graph. I hope you practiced it and knew how to do it. Here's what it looks like. You should have a flat portion on the upper end of the demand curve, a downward sloping portion in the middle, and a flat portion down there at the bottom as well. And the short run supply, uh, the, excuse me, the supply of reserves should intersect the demand for reserves in the flat portion. You should have policy rate on the y-axis and quantity of reserves on the x-axis. And at the intersection is where you see the policy rate or PR will be your, uh, what you're marking there. All right, And you can see there the demand for reserves uh, is going to shift downward. That's when we got uh, administered rates. All right, on to the next part. For F, we are going to uh, say based on the policy rate change we just showed, remember it decreased, what would happen to each of the following in the short run in alpha? Uh, the price of previously issued bonds. Well, we just saw that the interest rate went down and prices of bonds go the opposite direction. So we're going to say increase. No need to explain here. Moving on to the next part. What's going to happen to the price level? And now we have to explain. So here's my explanation. The price level is going to increase because the lower policy rate will decrease interest rates. Uh, that means gross investment and other interest rate sensitive spending will increase as a result of those lower interest rates and that will shift aggregate demand to the right. And that is why the price level is going to rise. All right, on to 
part two or question number two. We have a table here and it shows us some economic data for Luland based on the base year is year one and GDP deflator for year two is, uh, is 115. All right, first we're gonna calculate the real GDP of Luland in uh, year two. So remember your formula is nominal, which we've got here, there, divided by real, or excuse me, divided by the GDP deflator, then times 100. There we go. So I've got 1,035,000 divided by the GDP deflator of 115 times 100 equals $900,000 of real GDP in year two. On to the next part for B. Uh, how would Luland change, uh, how would the change in real GDP from year one to year two affect the demand for money? in the nominal interest rate and the nominal interest rate in Luland. Now remember this is the money market graph that they're referring to and the demand for money is two things. It's transaction demand and asset demand. Well, when GDP, real GDP increases, that is going to increase the transaction demand for money. So we're going to shift it to the right or increase it and that's going to increase the real or the, excuse me, the nominal interest rate in the money market. All right, on to part C. Did the standard of living of average citizens in Luland increase, decrease, or remain the same from year one to year two? Explain using numbers. Now, uh, this is the first time that I can recall where, uh, where we needed to calculate per capita real GDP because per capita real GDP is, is really the main measure of standard of living here. You take the real GDP divided by the population and that gives us per capita GDP. So I did that there, there you go. In year one, our per capita GDP is 800 and in year two, our per capita GDP is 750. So I got those numbers right up there from the chart, by the way, uh, for, uh, for year one. And then uh, for year two, we just calculated the real GDP. Oh, and the reason why year one is real GDP is because remember, real and nominal are the same for the base year. All right, so that means decrease because you can see that the per capita real GDP decreased. So decrease because the per capita G real GDP decreased from 800 to 750. On to part D, what was the numerical value of the inflation rate from year one to year two? Remember, calculating inflation, new minus old divided by old times 100 when you're looking at two CPIs or two GDP deflators. So there we go, I did that math and it's 15%. Oh, and remember the old GDP deflator or the, uh, would have been 100 because that is the base year's uh, index number for both CPI and GDP deflators, always 100. On to the next part for E, if nominal wages increased by 10% uh, from year one to year two, what happened to real wages of workers in Luland during this time explain? Well, the answer is it decreased because the nominal wage increased by less than the amount of inflation. And then I have our numbers there, 10% uh, is less than 15%. Uh, the uh, weight real wages would have just decreased by about 5%, all right, thereabouts, based on the Fisher formula. On to part three, we're going to assume that Malaysia's uh, economy is in a recession and its government currently has a balanced budget. We're going to identify a specific fiscal policy action that the government of Malaysia would implement to address the recession. We got two possibilities, here's both of them, decrease taxes or increase government spending. That is the fiscal policy action. If you were talking about monetary policy, that's not gonna get you the point. Fiscal policy here. On to the next part for part B. How will the fiscal policy action we identified affect the real interest rate in Malaysia? Remember real interest rate, the key there is that's a signal for the loanable funds market and we're going to explain. Now remember that the government has been deficit spending as a result of this change. They had a balanced budget before, now they have a deficit and that's going to cause the interest rate to increase because the government will now have a deficit and that will increase the demand, or you could say increase, uh, decrease the supply if you'd like, which is the one I prefer actually, of loanable funds. And that causes the interest rate to go up. On to part C, Malaysia and Japan are trading partners with flexible exchange rates. Malaysia's currency is the ringgit and Japan's currency is the yen. We're going to draw a correctly labeled graph of the foreign exchange market for the ringgit relative to the yen, show the effect of the change in the real interest rate identified in part B on the international value of the ringgit. All right, so remember, as we just saw, 
There it is. Remember the interest rate is decreasing. That means money wants to go towards that high interest rate so that foreign investors can earn that high interest rate. And if you want to invest where the high interest rate is, you need to have that currency. So we're going to see an increase in the demand for the, uh, for the ringgit, which is uh, MYR is the abbreviation that it tells us to use or implies that we should use within the uh, question. So that's what I've got down there. And I do think they will accept a decrease in supply as well, but as long as the exchange rate increases, as I have there. All right, on to the next one. Uh, for D, as a result of the change in the value of the ringgit shown in part C, will Malaysia's imports increase, decrease, or remain the same? Explain. This is a little bit of a tricky one, but remember we just saw an increase in the exchange rate. That means the currency has appreciated. That means it's more valuable than it was before. So that leads us to this explanation. It's going to uh, increase. Imports are going to increase because the ringgit appreciated. So imports are going to be relatively cheaper. It's essentially going to take fewer uh, ringgits to buy foreign made goods than it used to before. All right. And that's it. That's it, that's all of uh, set one. So, what do you think? Do you think I'm right? Do you think I'm way off base? Put your comments uh, uh, down below. Let me know what you think. Other than that, I really appreciate everybody uh, supporting ReviewEcon.com. Uh, if you haven't already, please uh, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like the videos that you've been watching. It really helps me with the algorithm moving forward. And thank you so much for your support. I'll take care, everybody. You guys have a great one. I'll see you all next time.